I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, with episode 13 of Ask Dave. Today's video is an introduction to the magical world of CW, that is, the use of the Morse code. Everyone who has an HF radio has at some point tuned to the CW portion of the ham bands. You'll hear all sorts of things, including many stations transmitting Morse code. Regardless of your class of license, and regardless of the fact that knowledge of the Morse code is no longer a requirement and hasn't been for many years, lots of people jump into CW and enjoy it. It's worth a second look. You may just find it to be right for you. Why bother with CW today? Well, it's like the resurgence of vinyl records and tubes in guitar amps sometimes a return to the simplicity of an earlier era brings a sense of authenticity that computers and fancy digital filters can't. Retro is in. Morse code is the ultimate in simplicity. A tone is either there or it isn't. There's no in between. It's unique. If you have an HF radio, you already have the radio you need for CW. All rigs have it. A lot has been said about how CW will get through where your voice won't. You see, if you use voice, you spread your signal power across a wide range of frequencies. But if you concentrate all that power just on one frequency, it's amazing how much the signal to noise ratio jumps up. In fact, you often need considerably less power to conduct a CW QSO than with a single sideband QSO. That has led to the rise in popularity of so-called QRP rigs, which are small transceivers that only put out about 5 watts. I actually have several of these little radios, and they're readily available in kit form or already constructed. While I don't recommend QRP as a first radio, they are interesting and capable. Let's take an example of 20 meters in the daytime or 40 meters in the evening. Start at the lower end of the band and tune up. You'll encounter some signals that zip by rather rapidly. As you get up around 14.050 on 20 meters, or 7.050 on 40 meters, you start to hear much slower code. This is where the real CW renaissance is taking place, and where you can find yourself comfortable even as a beginner. Let's take a look at the HF bands on this ARRL chart. Note that CW is allowed anywhere in any band, but almost always you'll find it in the lower part. And, note here, on 80 meters, there's a segment that technicians can use. If you happen to be a tech who already has an HF rig, this could be worth trying out. Techs also have code privileges on 40, 15, and 10 meters. I point out that these tech bands have been greatly expanded from what they were a few years ago. While we're on the chart, Look at the 30 meter band. It's entirely CW. So who does Morse code? Well, the old timers sure love it, and they're the people who zip along at a gazillion words a minute. I can remember when these CW bands were full of these high speed stations, but our older hands are moving on. They're being replaced by a whole new generation of hands who are claiming the CW bands as their own. By a huge margin, slow code is much more common than before. That's thanks to organizations such as FISTS and SKCC. In fact, SKCC insists you use a mechanical key, not a fancy electronic keyer. This encourages people to try their hands at slow code. I'm an SKCC member myself. So, let's talk about CW and what it is. 
First of all, in today's usage, CW and Morse code are considered synonymous. That wasn't always so. Morse code actually predates CW. Back during the days of the phenomenally inefficient spark transmitters, the best anyone could do, and mind you, I'm talking about top-of-the-line stations, was what was called a damped wave. The spark pushed energy into a resonant circuit, which would resonate for a while, but the oscillations died down. Then amateurs started using transmitters based on tubes and found they could obtain oscillations that didn't die down because the oscillator tube kept them going. So, instead of damped waves, these were continuous waves, or CW. Of course, the continuous wave needs to be interrupted by a key to transmit any information. Spark went by the wayside pretty quickly. We attribute the Morse code to Samuel F. B. Morse, but his major contribution was the idea that a current in a single wire could be interrupted by a key in specific patterns, with a different pattern for each number. Words would then be looked up in a codebook indexed by number. Morse's assistant, Alfred Vail, expanded the code to include letters and punctuation. Still, while this code was widely used in landline telegraphs and by the railroad companies, it took a German fellow by the name of Friedrich Gerke to regularize the way letters and numbers were formed. The code Gerke came up with is today called the International Morse Code and is what we use on radio today. Gerke's major innovation was that there were only two symbols, the dot and the dash, and every letter and number is composed of only dots and dashes. While that seems obvious to us today, the original Morse slash Veil code actually had four different lengths, which resulted in ambiguities. Okay, yeah, you need one more thing in addition to the radio you need a way to turn the signal on and off. This is done by means of a key. The term key comes from a key opening and closing something. In this case, the key opens or closes an electric circuit. From the very first, keys were conceptually similar to this antique railroad key. There is a knob and it moves up and down to make or break the circuit. Keys evolved over a period of many years and finally took this basic shape in 1881 with the introduction of the Bunnell Triumph Key, which solved many problems with mechanical stability in earlier keys. The key has a spring here and the tension is adjustable. It pivots here and this pivot can be adjusted as the key wears. The amount of up and down travel is adjusted here and the actual contact that turns on the current is right here. Here's the key I've used since my novice days 40 years ago. It's a Japanese copy of the classic Army J-38 key used during World War II and is annotated as a JJ-38. The important innovation in this key is the use of ball bearings instead of the pivot. I've had great success with this key. We call a key like this a straight key, meaning a key using the original up and down action without modification. Note that making a dot or a dash with a straight key is entirely manual. Every operator uses a key slightly differently. Even back in the days of the early telegraph, telegraphers got to know each other by the distinctive sound of the code they sent, or what's called an operator's fist. Straight keys are readily available. You can find some great keys for under $100 at websites such as morseexpress.com. These keys can last a lifetime. Early telegraph operators ran into problems with carpal tunnel syndrome after hours and hours of pumping the key up and down. 
So several companies came up with solutions. The longest lasting and most influential is the so-called bug, or a mechanical semi-automatic keyer. This photo shows an example from the 1920s. When the operator pressed the lever to the right, a spring mechanism produced dots in rapid succession. The dashes were manually formed by pressing the key to the left. By far and away, the most popular brand of bug, or semi-automatic keyer, is Vibroplex. Their original model was introduced in 1905, 111 years ago. You can still get brand new Vibroplex bugs built just like the originals. Yes, Vibroplex is the oldest name in ham radio, and they're still going strong. You can find them at Vibroplex.com. Mind you, I've never had a bug, but those who use them swear by them. I can usually tell when someone is using one because the handmade dashes are sometimes quite a bit longer than they should be compared to the dots. An operator who sends this way is said to have a swing. Almost all HF radios today have built-in electronic keyers. These are operated by paddles, such as my Bencher BY-1 shown here. It's all fully automatic. Press the paddle to the right and you get dots. Press the paddle to the left and you get dashes. In this particular example, we're dealing with the so-called iambic keyer. If you hold both paddles together, you get alternating dits and dahs. The speed of the code is set by an adjustment in the radio itself. Okay, so you want to get on CW. You have a key and a radio. But how to learn the code? Let me give you some wisdom here. Don't learn the code from a chart. Doing so trains your eyes, not your ears. Use some software to learn the sounds of the various characters. It used to be that when code was sent at five words per minute, the characters were long and drawn out like this. But the so-called Farnsworth method sends the characters at about 18 words per minute, but puts long spaces in between the letters so the equivalent rate is slower, like this. With the long, drawn-out letters, your brain is tempted to say, oh, that's a dot followed by a dash, which is the letter A. With the Farnsworth method, you hear da-da and recognize it as an A. A newer method has emerged that is built on the Farnsworth method. It's called the Koch method. It introduces characters a couple at a time, and as you get better, it adds characters to the mix. As you learn the characters, your speed improves. The website lcwo.net allows you to do this method online. I personally prefer a Koch trainer that's a download from g4fon.net because it gives you the ability to add realistic fading and interference, much like you'll encounter on the air. As you learn the letters, Listen on the air and decipher what you can, which will just be occasional letters at first. Be patient with yourself. The importance of listening on the air is that you'll learn how CW is actually used in practice. There are abbreviations, Q signals, and pro signs, all of which greatly speed up the exchange of information. And the very best method to increase your code proficiency is to get on the air and make contacts. You can listen to practice code all day, and even on the air code. But when you realize there's a real person at the other end who's sending to you and you're sending to him or her, that's when the real learning comes. That means you have to learn to send as well as receive. Your dots need to be crisp and all of the same length. 
The same with your dashes. The most common mistake I hear from those new to CW is that their dashes and dots are about the same length. Really hard to copy. Back in ancient times, when I was a new college graduate, I found Randy, a new novice just like me, who lived about a mile away. We got on the air late in the evening, several nights a week, to practice. Together, we got our code speed and copying accuracy up well past the then required 13 words per minute. We set our general exams on the same day at the FCC office in Los Angeles. You might do the same. Find a buddy and get on the air frequently and practice your code. The ARRL publishes a small but worthwhile book called Morse Code Operating for Amateur Radio. It's available from the ARRL or for a couple bucks less on Amazon. Plus, Amazon's shipping is less expensive. I'll put a link to the Amazon page on my website and in the YouTube description. Learning and using the Morse code opens a whole new amateur radio experience. You can use your newfound skill to have casual rag chewing contacts, participate in contests, find cool DX, and earn proficiency awards. I neglected my CW skills for a few decades and am now building it back up with the goal of getting back to where Randy and I were when we sat our general exams in 1975. This video has provided a high-level overview. Let me know what parts interest you the most and I'll make them topics of future Ask Dave videos. Our photo for this episode is taken along the rim of the Chavano Valley, just one of the many places around here that can be explored via the area's ATV trails. Be sure to subscribe to get notification of future Ask Dave videos. And you can send a question to me by commenting on this video or by using the form at ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. I try really hard to answer every question, either individually or via one of these videos. If this video has been particularly useful to you, there's a tip jar on my YouTube channel page and another on my website at ke0og.net. Keep those comments and questions coming. Until next time, 73.